My name is Manuel, I'm from Linotronics and I wanted to talk with you about Debian-based embedded systems and some tooling around that called Elbe. Um, let's see what's the plan for today. So basically I want to answer the question, why should I use Debian, why should I use Elbe, what other methods are there to create such Debian-based systems or what are other things you could do to build an embedded systems. Um, then I want to talk about the features Elbe currently provides. Uh, I will show you an example by the Texas Instruments Beaglebone Black board to build an SD card image for that board. Uh, and then we will have a look at customizing this image for a specific need. And we show how to develop and integrate own applications into that image. And the last thing will be, we will uh, think about what's next, what's the direction of, of the development in LB itself. Maybe you have also ideas uh, what should be possible with LB. So, if you are in the need of having a distribution, of having an embedded Linux-based system, you have a decision to make. One is, I want to build my own distribution, uh, something we heard in the talk before. And it's uh, something you need to do. So you have to uh, write receipts and do maintenance work and so on. So you, you know that. And maybe it's too much for you. So maybe you crash with that because you don't have the development power and so on. And so it might be harder than you think at the moment. So you can see the Yocto project or something like that uh, that looks really good maintained and is it in the fact also. Um, but um, you have a huge knowledge base you need if you want to adapt the system. So um, by the way, you need to wait until every package uh, is ready. You need to compile it. You just can't, like on a desktop, say apt-get install this and that library and try something out. You always have some effort to make that it is on the system. Um, then the binaries that come out of such a build process are maybe uh, in a binary format you are the only one that uses that because you have special configure flags and so on. And you are so the probably only one who is testing those binaries. Um, and this is also the effect you might be then alone with some bugs that are in those binary packages. And at least you are responsible for tracking the security of your whole self-built distribution. And what we ask ourselves what are, is this really needed? Do you, we really need to build our own distribution? Or is there not anybody else who could do this job for us? And so we found in the desktop fraction a lot of distributions that are providing ready-to-use binary packages. And we ask ourselves, could we use this on an embedded board, on an embedded system? And if so, which one is the best to choose of all those distributions that are around who provide binary packages? We resulted in the choice of Debian because this graphic is a bit overloaded, I think. But basically what I want to tell you, you can understand Debian because it's an open community-based distribution. There's no vendor behind Debian. And all the tools you need to rebuild a Debian distribution are available for free. Uh, they also have a really good documentation, an open development process, and you have interfaces to retrieve all the build logs of the binary packages and so on. So basically, you have the same information as you, you have if you build the distribution yourself in, on your boards. Maybe it's better because it's uh, with web applications around and user interfaces and so on. And the process is really open. You can get involved as deep as you want if you invest some time. So basically, if you want to use Debian on an embedded system, it's not that hard. They already provide a lot of tooling for doing that. 
By the way, Debian is available for a lot of different architectures. So you have, of course, x86 support, but also two different kind of ARMs, MIPS, PowerPC, and so on. They provide binary packages for all of these architectures. So what you basically do is you use some Debian repository available on the internet, and then use a tool called dBootstrap. It's a tool from Debian. You can just install it on your desktop PC, and you tell Debian what you want. I want an ARM-based system with these and that packages inside. And what you get back is a Debian-based root file system in some folder on your de desktop PC. So just extract it and put there. Um, then you have to do something by manual. Typically, dbootstrap has a second stage that needs to run on the target. You can use emulation for that, or you can just copy the stuff over on an SD card and run it on the target. And this is the, what you typically do. And then you do some manual modification, remove documentation, man pages, um, install some additional packages, and so on. And then you get your customized root file system for your product. And after that, you can use some open source tools to produce a firmware image that is later uh, flashable on a NAND flash, SD card, or whatever. For doing that, you have several uh, possibilities to do that. So you can use, just as I explained in the slide before, the bootstrap plus a, a bunch of shell scripts. This was the way we started in the early days. Um, because shell scripts enable me to reproduce the same thing. But as we uh, started with a second and third word, we, we learned we need to modify these shell scripts for a specific board, then we copied it all over and hell began of, of maintenance. So um, there are different options you have. Uh, for example, there are dbootstrap the whoppers that provide exactly that infrastructure to you. Um, they allow customization scripts that can be versioned in Git. They allow creating uh, images at the end for, uh, basically it is VM for virtual machine. So they started with virtual machine disk images, but uh, nowadays they have support for a lot more image formats. Um, so this is something you can use. Um, then there is ESAR. That is a project uh, that uses the Yocto infrastructure to uh, just run dbootstrap and other scripts so that it, you can use Yocto to maintain your custom board. Um, and then there is another interesting thing you might have heard of. It's Meta Yocto. It's another Yocto based uh, thing. Uh, and I try to use Debian source code and use the Yocto infrastructure to build binary packages out of the Debian source code, which is a good idea because you have those maintained and really wide used sources with exactly the same patches Debian uses and you have a reproducible build, but you have the thing you always need to build the stuff by your own. Um, the question is why are why should I use Elbe now? There are still a lot of possibilities to use. And it's uh, quite simple to answer because Elbe produces brilliant firmware images with no bugs inside. <laughs> yeah, I think you don't believe me. <laughs> so Elbe is just Python code that uses Debian infrastructure and tools is the real answer. So what we try to do is uh, to have a project description in a single XML file. So every project is one XML file. We don't want it to be distributed in different layers, folders, and so on to get together a config in some more or less magical way. Uh, then we said we just want to integrate Debian binary package. We don't care of building our own software. Um, for the upstream project, so for all the basic tools like Bash, BusyBox, uh, Firefox, or whatever you want to have on your system. But it allows you to build own software components uh, and 
as we say, build own software components. We may mean modified packages from upstream where you say, I need an additional version or something like that. Or we mean your own application because normally you don't want to sell an embedded board with a plain Debian and no other application on top. Um, then we want to produce flashable images. So we want that uh, LB produces output that can be used directly to flash it by JTAG or whatever way. And we want to be able to regenerate the images maybe a few years later and regenerate the whole build environment also. So what we thought about is the easiest thing to do is to run much of the LB stuff inside a virtual machine <coughs> where we know what is installed in and that also is created by LB. So if you put in an LB XML file, the virtual machine will be created if it's not available. And then the whole image is built inside this virtual machine and transferred back to your host PC. And what goes out is not only the image that you flash on the system, it is also included a rebuild CD where all the Debian binary packages are on that are needed to build this init VM, this initial virtual machine, and the target image. We also provide a source code CD-ROM where all the Debian source packages are there. That is something you might want to give to your customers that you say this is the source code in a format you can reproduce the whole system. So because uh, licenses say uh, you need not to ship only the source code, you also need to ship the information how you transfer the source code into the binary format. And with a Debian package, you have all those information you need. Then we create some license files that you see what licenses are inside my embedded system. Um, and this is all generated out of the Debian repositories um, that are out there on the internet. By the way, if you don't want to connect to the internet during build, you also can uh, do a replication of a Debian mirror on your own company site, yeah? Uh, on, the, on the virtual machine, did I hmm? get it right? This is some kind of solution which you provide to customers or what's in your virtual machine? Could the same solution be installed on any Linux distribution? It can or be installed. Mm -hmm. the yeah, the virtual machine is just a plain Debian installation uh, with the LB software components called LB Daemon or LB build environment installed. We package them also as Debian package that it's easy to install them inside the machine. But you also can run the LB source, the, the LB Daemon and so on on your host PC. It's not a problem. You trust you. Uh, lose those reproducibility of the images because you don't know which version of Gpart it is installed on my host PC at the time I generated the image and so on. So the question was whether it is generated by in the tool itself or whether it is pre-installed by manual. It is generated by LB itself. So basically at the moment we have a LB stable version with the number 1.1, .1. it was, uh, version 1 was released Christmas last year, so I hope getting a version 2 until Christmas this year. Um, the version 1 supports target images for ARM Little Endian, ARM HF, e, uh, x86, 32, and 64-bit, and PowerPC. Debian supports a, a few more architectures but uh, we just didn't test LB on that. Maybe it works, but no guarantee about that. We don't use it. Um, then we support some uh, image formats. This is MS-DOS uh, formatted disks, also GPT formatted disks. Then just the tarball you might want to use as NFS root file system or something like that. CPIO for initRDs, uh, SquashFS, and for NAND, we have UBI and UBFS support included. Then we have the availability of fine-tuning targets. So you can describe in your XML, you want to copy over some files from here to there or move them 
or you want to execute a command inside the target root file system. Then we have the possibility to extract an archive over the whole target root file system. This archive file is tarball that's just embedded base64 encoded inside the XML file. It is not meant to integrate your own application. There are big binary blobs. It's just meant for having some config files for your Apache web server or something like that. We also are able to uh, generate target-related sysroots for cross-compile tool chains. This is important for developing your own application against the Debian-based root file system. So what you can do, you can say, Elbit generate me uh, a sysroot for this or that uh, target, and then you get a, a tarball that includes all the libraries that are on the target, including the headers for those libraries and the development versions of the libraries that are there. And we just resolved that um, by uh, using information from the Debian project. So we look uh, what uh, binary pack, what development package fits to which binary package and install them additionally into those sysroots. And as I told, we get CD-ROMs with all used Debian source packages and one with all the binary packages. And there, all the packages from this initial virtual machine are also included on this CD-ROM. So you can just uh, archive this binary CD-ROM and say uh, LB init for mcreate and give the ISO image and the whole thing is regenerated from that step. Another nice thing is you can check for updates of a generated pack, uh, target image. So what we do is we store inside the XML file during a run which packages are installed on the target with which version. And then we have a command LB check updates. You put in those XML file and it looks on the reference mirrors if there are any updates available for this target. And typically what goes out of some debootstrap uh, process is a Debian with all those essential packages. So essential is a tag that a package can have in Debian. And essential is everything marked that is needed that apt is running, so the package manager. But maybe you don't want to have a package manager on the target and you, it has a dependency to Perl and so on, and this is the reason why images get quite big, even if you just install those essential packages. And so we thought about a mode to generate a shrink target out of this essential Debian system to even get smaller. Then we have another version of Elbit. This is the one we are currently working on. It will be the next major release called 2.0, and the development version is called 1.9. I think 70 or something like that at the moment. And of course, we have some new features in Elbit testing uh, that are not in the stable release. So we just want to get them stable, and if they are stable, we make the new stable release that you can use always the stable release without uh, big troubles. Uh, so what we have done. Uh, for LB2.0 is LBP builders, a uh, thing that you can use for building own Debian packages. So you have a source code and LB produces the Debian binary package. Then we have support for ARM64 targets. Um, we now show the build log because LB1.0 just shows wait project is busy as long as the whole target is generated. And this may take uh, half an hour or something like that and just see wait project is busy and you have no idea how far you are in, in the process. And so nowadays we display this build log instead of this busy log. This is something some user requested, but it's definitely useful. Then we have some tooling to generate SPDX files out of the Debian license information because the new uh, license information format of Debian is, human, uh, is machine parsable and so we can transfer it to XML and then have some tooling to uh, pr transfer those information into SPDX files. However, not all packages in Debian provide machine parsable um, license file and the licenses in Debian, the terms, 
uh, that are used there are different ones than in SPDX, so you need to do some mapping, and we just developed some tooling that, that can do that. Then uh, we added extended partition support for MS-DOS HD. Um, so basically these are the things that stabilize now. Uh, the biggest thing is this LBP builder thing. And if you want to use LB you can, and you have a Debian installation on your host PC, it's quite easy. You can trust uh, at the Linotronix repositories and install LB with apt. Uh, if you don't want to install LB into your system, it's also possible to just clone the Git repository and use it in tree. <coughs> so the first thing you need to do is to create this initial virtual machine. Uh, this is done with the command LB init v em create, and you can give a directory where this init vm is stored. Um, the init vm is, as I told you, a basic Debian installation uh, chassis at the moment, including the LB daemon package. Um, it is used to build those firmware images inside the init vm, and as I told you, it's reproducible from, from this bin CD-ROM output. The init vm is not started automatically if you, boot, uh, if you boot your host PC, so you always need to start it explicitly with this command. And now let's have a look at a concrete example. So if you want to have a, an SD card image for a BeagleBone Blackboard, how does this XML file look like? So what we have is uh, just a uh, schema description for our XML file. It's called after the development name of LB because as we started in 2007, I think, we called it Debian Build System for Embedded Devices, Debian but our marketing thought it's no good name. I don't understand <laughs> that. <laughs> but we kept this in the schema because nobody sees it, typically. So, um, what we have is a project description here. So we have some name of the project, a version, a human readable description, and the build type, what is basically the name of the Debian uh, architecture you want to use. It's arm hard float in this example. Then we have a reference to a Debian mirror, and we distinguish here between a, a mirror that describes where you can retrieve all those packages that are marked essential. So dbootstrap runs from this mirror. There's the availability to add some additional Debian repositories here in something called URL list. There you can add some other repositories, but it's important that the uh, top one is one where dbootstrap can run on. Uh, then we specify which Debian suite you want to use. You can also use um, chassis on LB 1.0, even if the chassis, uh, even if the LB 1.0 init VM is based on Wheezy. So, because you can trust the bootstrap a chassis system on a Wheezy system, this is no problem. Then we describe our target. Um, basically, we give them. Uh, a host name, a domain name to it. This is something Elbit just feeds into those files where Debian expects it. You can set a root password there and specify a serial console. This one is used on uh, x86, for example. Uh, that bootlog is displayed there, so we set up the crop config that it is uh, entered there. It is used that a getty is started on with a, a login prompt is started on this serial console and so on. And then you just specify uh, the output. Here we define some MS-DOS-based partitioning shame uh, and the output file name should be sdcard.img with a size of 1.5 gigabyte. And then we have one partition with 50 megabyte size that has a label called boot, and the bootable tag should be set on this partition. And then we had a second partition that should be used the remaining size of the whole image and called uh, RFS. 
And on the next slide, you can see uh, the file system table. So this is the thing where you describe which file system should be on which partition and where should it be mounted. So we just referenced these labels here. So as you can see on the slide before, we had a label called RFS here. So this one is mounted on slash, formatted to, with extended two file system. Uh, and we have another one called boot that is mounted on boot, formatted by VFAT because the TI bootstrap code uh, loads the bootloader from this partition. And then we have some fine tuning section here. I think uh, I just showed it in the order the schema needs. So it's better to have a look at package list first. So what we install is a Debian based system that comes out of the bootstrap plus uboot package and Linux image package. So Debian also packaged U-Boot for ARM and a multi-platform kernel for, for ARM, including device trees for a lot of common evil boards. So you don't need to have build your own kernel, your own bootloader. Of course, you're, you can do that, but there is no need to do that for a common evil boards. I want to show you here. But what you need to do is, for example, all the device trees that are packaged, this is not the only one that is in this uh, kernel package in Debian. They have also device trees for other birds. So I just copy this one over to a place the bootloader expects it. And the same for the U-boot image and for the first stage bootloader. The next thing is what I do here is I just say echo uenv command set and boot args and so on to boot uenv txt. So this is the way I set an, an additional configuration to uboot. This uenv txt while is read during boot from uboot. So I can uh, set up something here with just echoing something. This is also possible. You could also put this uh, file into the archive that is ba embedded base64 encoded inside the XML file would be just another way to do it, but the XML file is then not so human readable then if you do it this way. So this is basically everything you need to describe to create a bootable image for BeagleBone Black. And if you want to get it built by the init VM, you just say lb init VM submit, and I use an extra attribute here called keep files, which means store the project inside the init v VM. The default is to delete it after a successful build, because if you run nightly builds in Jenkins or something like that, you run into the situation the lb init VM is just full with a lot of embedded projects. So we use this keep files uh, just for development and normally. Um, and I give the XML file as an input. We have a lot of examples inside the Git repository or we install it in user share doc, lb doc, if you uh, used our Debian packages. Um, if you inspect the build output, uh, you see this binary CD-ROM that uh, is needed for reproducing everything. Then an LB report TXT, where we just list all files that are on the target system and who produced them. So is this, was this introduced by fine tuning? Was this installed by some Debian package and so on? And some more interesting informations about your target. Those text files are in the ASCII doc format, by the way. So it's easily possible to transfer it into a website or a PDF document if you need that. Then uh, we have this license txt file and basically the same information as an XML file. Um, but the XML file can be used by this SPDX tooling to continue uh, generating such SPDX informations. Then we have a log file where we just uh, capture all the output D bootstrap and so on generates. Uh, actually our image, we want to use DD later to uh, dump it on an SD card. Um, and we have this source XML file, which is basically the thing you put into the, the 
on the top, but it was uh, added with some sections where you can see which packages are installed. Are they installed by the bootstrap or as a dependency of one package in your package list or did you specify it explicitly, including the version of the package so that is the thing LBA check update uses to see if there are updates available for your image. Then we have the source CD-ROM that includes a Debian repository with all the source packages that were used. And at the end we have some validation TXT file. This is useful. You can use this one as input again. And then we verify if all the Debian packages were installed with the same version and with no difference. And if we see a difference, we log it just in this validation text file. Yeah? I'm sort of missing uh, an output package repository, which I may use to update other um, boards in the field. Mm -hmm. And I'm missing an output for debug packages for mm -hmm. debugging purposes. So the question was, uh, where are the Debian packages that I can update uh, images inside the field? And where are Debian packages with debug information and so on that I can debug um, my thing? Answer to the first question is, they are all in a repository that is stored on this bin CD-ROM. So you can extract it from there. And you have the possibility, we have no brilliant control interface for that at the moment, but technically it's possible to also generate uh, uh, some archive file with just updated packages if you uh, give this source XML as input file again. But we can discuss this later if you are interested in something like that or on the mailing list. Um, the second question about the debugging symbols and so on, uh, this is something we generate uh, with a special command called abcontrol uh, build sysroot. There you get an archive of all debug in information, development files, and so on. Um, in LB2, this was the output of LB1. In LB2, the images are just cheat zipped compressed because we transfer them from the virtual machine to your host PC and this took quite a long time for big image files and they can, you can reduce the size a lot if you just cheat zip them. So uh, what we do here is just unzip it and uh, push it on an SD card. And then you can boot to your BeagleBone Black um, maybe you are happy with a big Debian beer in your hand, but everything is a lot, bit bloated for embedded, you, you know. So what you wanna, might want to do is shrink the whole Debian image to get just, uh, just to fit into smaller uh, pieces of flash. So some ideas are you can remove man pages, you can remove unneeded locales or package lists. Uh, this can be done in this fine-tuning sectioning in the XML file. Um, this is, uh, so if you remove the package lists, this is something app get update retries. Uh, unneeded locals and man pages, you can reduce the image size by about, I think, 80 to 100 megabyte. Um, then you can set the no recommend tag inside uh, the XML file. So Basically, Debian says uh, a binary package can have dependencies that are hard, that the, the reference packages need to be installed on the system, that the one package is working, and there are suggestions. So they recommend to install an additional package, and the feature of the basic package is uh, the feature set of the basic package is higher. So if you set this no recommend tag, we just don't install this recommendation because app does this by default. And so if you have a long package list, this can also reduce it significantly, the image size. And if this is also not enough, and you say, maybe I don't need app on the system or something like that, we have even uh, two modes that can be used, the diet or the titan mode, to copy over the output of the bootstrap and additionally install packages uh, to the target directory. So 
Basically, what we call change root in Elbisha Gore is the output of the bootstrap plus the packages that are installed from the package list inside the XML file. And then, in default mode, we just copy over this change root directory in a directory called target. And on this ta target directory, we extract the archive and run those fine-tuning rules, and the image generation works on this target directory. And what the modes are basically doing is just uh, alter the way this copy is done. So the default mode is just a one-to-one -one copy, as I told you. The diet mode uh, looks at the package list uh, in XML, uh, calculates the runtime dependencies of all those packages using apt, uh, and then installs just these packages or copy over just the files from these packages to the target directory. So you have basically runnable packages, but uh, not everything that is on an essential Debian system is installed on your target. So what we also do is we run all those post-install script you might, I don't know if you're that deep in Debian, and that made file that they run on the target directory because not all essential packages are there and maybe it's a Perl script and the Perl interpreter is missing and we just ignore those errors so the result is definitely uh, a target image but you miss some, you might miss some files like for example etc pass vd or something like that because the generation failed and then you need to use fine tuning or archive files to add those files you need again. So it's harder to produce a diet image than a default image, of course. Uh, then we have another mode called Titan. It's basically the same as the diet mode, but we don't even resolve the runtime dependencies. So just the files referenced on the package list, uh, or the, the files from the packages referenced on the package list are copied over to the target system. I love this Titan mode for creating really small systems like just uh, having busybox static inside the package list and then I just get a CPIO image with a busybox system inside. Of course, uh, the customization part in the XML file gets bigger uh, as far as you go down in those copy modes. And at the end, if you use such a copy mode and use fine tuning and so on, you can shrink the Debian-based image to a quite small size. And the interesting thing is you can reproduce this after and after again because it's all described in the XML file. And you don't need to have custom scripts and so on for different purposes. Um, but what's still missing is you want to integrate your own application into the system, I think. or add users and so on. For adding users, we also have fine-tuning commands, by the way, and groups. But adding own software in LB2.0 is, for example, that easy. If you want to integrate, for example, the libgpio we wrote uh, some years ago, you can just reference a Git repository and a optionally specify a revision tag. That is useful if you want to integrate always the same revision of uh, some software. If you want to integrate always the latest version, just skip this revision tag. And what we then do is we use uh, a pbuilder mechanism to transfer the source code into a binary Debian package. Some details of that follow soon. And what you need to know, you need to specify this package in the package list again because out of one Debian source package, you can generate N Debian binary packages. For example, the D one including the debugging symbols and so on. And you don't want to have all of them on your target typically, so you need to re-specify what should be on the target. Um, you need to Debianize your source code if you want to use that. So what this means is, you need to produce a Debian compatible information how to transfer source code into binary format. It's something like a bit bake receipt, um, but it's split it out into different files. 
but basically you need to enter the same information you ha have also in the Octo you have those basic classes for auto tools and based projects and so on you have a similar mechanism in Debian called Deb helpers that you can use there and there is a quite cool tool called dhmake that just produces a template for your application where you just need to fill in some more information about your package and then you can use this uh, LBP builder feature to build the application. Uh, we don't have invited all this pbuilder functionality. Basically, it's based on the PDE build project and QAMO user to emulate ARM targets and so on. So it's a common way to build packages. It is documented in several places in Debian Wiki and so on. And we just made it to be uh, to reuse this out of, and regenerate all of these environments out of the XML file. Uh, of course, all those build dependencies need to be specified correctly because pbuilder always works in an, uh, in an uh, Debian environment where only the essential packages are installed and uh, all other packages uh, need to come out of your build dependencies that need to be specified in your Debianization. The build environment is created from the same Debian mirrors and so on as your target image. So if you use, for example, Deb mirror to keep a static version of Debian with no updates and so on in your company, you can rely that you always build against the same binaries than the ones that are on your target, even if you create the pbuilder environment later than your target image. Of course, for application development, development. This is not feasible because pbuilder um, installs all those build dependencies, then uh, builds your software packages as Debian uh, package, puts it into a Debian repository, regenerates the whole image. This needs, of course, uh, uh, some time. And if you just want to develop an application, this is overkill. So we have LB build sysroot for this. This is the feature I told you where you can integrate uh, into a cross compiler tool chain all those headers and libraries that are, uh, fit to the ones that are on your target. So after that, I hope your little Tux is happy and has a good party because it's stable, good Debian based system with your own application and so on. And we hope to fix all those open issues for LB2 till Christmas or something like that this year. And then we think about new ideas for the next version of LB. And what we are just thinking about, no guarantee that this will be in LB3 or if we just uh, do some other things, maybe you have ideas. Uh, one is at the moment, we just create those debootstrap change routes, use QAMU user to change into the target file systems. And there are some nice things like Linux containers where you uh, can start an init of the whole target system and then you have a, the whole target system running inside the init VM with, with all those demons and so on. And this is something you need if you, for example, want to install MySQL that just inserts something into the database uh, as post-install step. So they want to have the MySQL daemon running uh, uh, after it is installed that they can insert default users and so on. Uh, another thing we, we need to work on is improving the logging and report generation. At the moment, we are quite happy that we get most information out of app because they do really crazy file descriptor pipeline stuff uh, and uh, the output ends somewhere. And now we think we grabbed all that we need. And the next thing we want to do is we want to, uh, we have some build jobs inside the init VM. So ever you submit something, there's a build job generated and so on. And this can, get an idea and then we can log all together into some database using log for pi or something like that and then generate a customized log file out of this database because 
we, we learned that some of our users are interesting, trust in the output of their fine tuning rules or trust in the output of the debootstrap process and so we can filter that better. Then we want to improve the session management because at the moment you have one init VM and you can build one project per user per time. Uh, so you can say LB, LB init VM sub submit can also have a user and uh, password argument that you can run it on some central installation and we have the limitation that one user just can walk at one project at the moment and this is some something not really technical argumented but, but it wa was the way it was developed and we need to change this that one user can work on several uh, projects at the same time. Uh, and then we think about sharing some source code with tools like VMD Bootstrap because it's also write, written in Python. They also generate disk images. They also have the problem to install crap there and so on. And they basically, I have had a look at the source code these days and trust the Python classes look nearly the same than ours. So we, I think we should share code with them and not having the, the problems in two code repositories and fix them in two ones. And yeah, that's basically so my thoughts about what might be in LB3. So if you want to use LB, have a look at our website. There is also reference to our devil mailing list. You can also ask user questions there, that's no problem. Uh, and the source code is available on GitHub. But the recommended way is to just use the Debian pro uh, packages if you just want to try it out. So my conclusion is, uh, for all the things you can get help from other projects, let other projects do the work, let Debian do the maintenance work, they do a great job. Don't try to build everything by your own if you don't really need to do it. Um, then use cross tool chains with LB generated sysroot to do your application development. Then you can use LBP Builder to integrate it nightly into your image. And then you can use uh, the LB image build to produce those uh, flashable images and focus on your application development and not building your own distribution. So thank you a lot for your attention. And I think if we have one or two questions, we might can answer it now. And on the other hand, I will be out of the room later for questions. Yes? I have a curiosity. Is what is your use of RML or RML? Architecture? It's ARM little engine. It's the name as Debian calls this architecture. Basically, okay. it's for ARM v5 and, and earlier. I, I was okay. just asking, are you still using this architecture? Uh, no, not really uh, in current projects, but Debian supports it and uh, as we started with LB, uh, it was a common architecture, so we still support it. And then, uh, when there was a curiosity, then <coughs> when do you plan to upload LB to Debian repositories? Ah, uh, we, we thought about that, but uh, this uh, combines with something like code sharing with VM, bootstrap, and so on. But basically, uh, I was in contact with the embedded Debian mailing list. Uh, some people like LB, others say, yeah, there, there are other tools and scripts that do the same job. We, we don't need LB, but I think it's no problem to integrate LB. The only problem at the moment is debootstrapping this initial machine uses the Debian installer. And for that purpose, we build a Debian package, including the Debian installer. And this would be a source code replication of the Debian installer. And this, uh, while it's a De Debian policy, and this is definitely something I want to fix and have some other tool or some other mechanism to recreate the initial virtual machine. Uh, but this affects also the ESO generation and so on. And it's bit tricky, but it's something we, we have in care, but it's a bit of work to do for that. Yes? Is it possible to uh, patch upstream packages? Yes, it's possible. You can just use app get source, patch the upstream package, and then use LBP Builder to integrate it in your file system. 
yeah, it runs automatically. If you um, put a section like this into your XML file, where you reference here needs to be the patched source code and there need to be this Debian directory inside and then LBP Builder builds it and here you reference it that it is also installed on the target. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's quite easy. You get this license.xml file and then you can just write a small snippet of code where you can say is what packages uh, use this license and get a list of these packages. Should be, uh, I think, four or five lines of Python code. Okay, but, but prevent them to get it into no, that is not possible. Uh, so we can just have a look, is it used inside the image, and then we need some manual modification to remove it from the image. There are tools helping by doing this. For example, you can just trim a live image, and then you can use LB diff or LB package diff to get the difference to your original image, and then you get recommendations how to alter your XML file to get this result. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Yes? No, currently not. Uh, we thought about using AppCacher, for example, inside the init VM, but then the init VM image gets rather big, so it's something we recommend to users. You can use AppCacher as a transparent proxy, for example. Does it support incremental building? If I add packages to mm -hmm. the cell? Yes, adding is possible, removing is not possible at the moment because removing is quite hard. Yes? What's the minimum file size or request file size you could use for this image? With default mode on our ARM system, I think it's 300 megabyte or something like that. Then as I told you, you can easily remove those package lists, uh, locales, and man pages that reduces it by about 100 megabyte. And if you want to get really down, it's possible to get images with five megabyte and just a busy box inside with those modes. So, thank you a lot. Oh. Now we use something custom at the moment, but it's something we want to get rid of. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, thank you a lot, and if you have any questions, you can find out. Later.